Hello, my name is Jared Ludlow, Publications Director at the BYU Religious Studies Center, your weekly resource for gospel scholarship. Today I'm joined by Emma Taylor, one of our editing interns here at the RSC. And we'll be talking about some possible resources that can accompany your Come Follow Me reading for June 5th through 11th, John chapters 14 through 17. The first is called Lamb of God, Unique Aspects of the Passion Narrative in John by Eric Huntsman, a religion faculty member here at BYU, and it comes from an Easter conference presentation. And as the title suggests, he examines how John, in the Gospel of John, presents the Passion narrative, or Jesus' last week of suffering and crucifixion, and points out some surprising differences with the other three synoptic Gospels. He lists some things such as the timing of the Last Supper and the crucifixion, which John actually places before the Passover, the omission in the account of the Last Supper of the institution of what we would call the sacrament, and the addition of the practice of the washing of feet, the long discourses at the Last Supper, the omission of any report of Jesus' suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, the portrayal of Jesus carrying his own cross all the way to Golgotha without any reference to Simon of Cyrene, and the words, it is finished before Jesus expires upon the cross. So, Emma, anything stand out to you from this article? Yeah, I thought it was really interesting how all the details are backed by the fact that uh, John's Gospel is centered on Christ, Christology, and um, I like the, the way that everything was explained and the details just uh, showed Christ's control over his divinity and uh, emphasized his, yeah, more divine origins rather than human suffering. So I thought that... Um, gave a very interesting outlook into why these details were changed in comparison to the synoptics. Very good. Yeah, so the Gospel of John does uh, have what we sometimes call a high Christology, more divine, as you mentioned, uh, portrayal of Jesus and emphasizing his more divine nature as creator and so forth. And so that seems to be a big reason uh, why John would be different. Um, Professor Huntsman also talks about the th thematic symbolism of Jesus as the Lamb of God, and so focusing on the sacrificial death, where Jesus, like the Paschal or Passover lamb, sheds his blood um, so that death, spiritual as well as physical, may pass over his people. And so it's much more focused on, I think, symbolism mm -hmm. of the sacrifice rather than worrying about the details of, of the sacrifice. And uh, at the end, he concludes with, On that cruel instrument of death, the blood of the Lamb of God flowed. But in being so lifted up, with streams of flowing water, Jesus promised that we too would be lifted up to everlasting life. The second article is called The Legal Cause of Action Against Jesus in John chapter 18, 29 through 30. It's by John or Jack Welch, a former law professor here at BYU, and also comes from an Easter conference volume. And with his legal background, he, of course, focuses on uh, questions that a lot of uh, people have when they look at the legal aspects of Jesus' uh, trial and execution, uh, such as, was he put to death by Romans or by Jews? Was it on political charges or for religious offenses? Were the proceedings legal or illegal? And at various times, uh, Professor Welch has dealt with those things. But in this particular article, he's going to focus on, as the title suggests, John 18, 29 through 30, where it reads, Pilate then went out unto them, the Jewish leaders, and said, What accusation bring ye against this man, Jesus? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. And so he focuses a lot on this word, malefactor, which comes from the Greek kakopoios, which in the Latin is maleficus, and in legal context can mean magician or sorcerer. So it kind of puts a whole different uh, spin on what they might be arguing about between Pilate and these leaders, whether Jesus might have some association with magician or sorcerer because of his healing. So any other insights that you gained from this? Uh, article? Yeah, this article was super interesting to me. I would never really thought about Jesus as like uh, engaging in the paranormal 
Um, but the details that Welsh brought up, it all like fit and it made sense as to why they would have been brought up against him. I also thought it was interesting that he brought up the passage in the Book of Mormon that said that uh, people would accuse Christ of having a devil in him and how that lines up with this accusation that would eventually lead to his crucifixion. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, we usually think of magic in terms of playing tricks and card mm -hmm. games and all, but um, in the ancient world, uh, they attributed a lot of things to sorcery or magical powers, and certainly with Jesus's wide array of miracles, some people started thinking that he had some kind of magical powers. Um, and so at the end of his article, he asked some questions of why more people haven't looked into this, and a few th suggestions he had is few scholars want to allow that the miracles of Jesus really happened, and so they don't want to get into that. Second, Christians today generally do not want to associate Jesus with magic or with any suggestion that he was a trickster. Or third, critical scholars generally give more historical weight to the accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke rather than in John. Um, but he concludes with, I think, a key point, he, that Jesus came to win the cosmic battle against death and hell to engage the powers of evil, to drive out devils from paralytics and demoniacs, and to cast out Satan eternally. How could he do all of this and not find himself accused of dealing with the realms of the paranormal? And the third article is To Know God is Life Eternal. It's by Camille Frank Olson, a former religion professor here at BYU. And it comes from a volume published by the RSC called Let Us Reason Together, Essays in Honor of the Life's Work of Robert L. Millett. And in this chapter, she explores the connection between knowing God, becoming like Christ, and receiving eternal life. Uh, she's focusing a lot on the intercessory prayer. Yet she also balances that with consideration of the parable of the unprofitable servant and other teachings by the Savior and, and his servants that can assist us to discover how to know God and to recognize our deepening knowledge. Uh, so anything stand out to you from this article? Yeah, I appreciated her explanation about how the way that we follow the commandments shouldn't necessarily be a way to get to heaven, but more of like a foundation of how we're going to live in heaven. So like rather than like stepping stones being uh, ways that we can become more like God and that's how we'll be in the afterlife. So, so more of the becoming rather than just all the yeah, doing. Yeah, and the getting kind of there, yeah. Good. Yeah, it's interesting how she brings in the parable of the unprofitable servant and focuses a lot on that um, because I don't think we often think of this parable in relationship to our discipleship, but this is just a servant who just does what the servant is supposed to do and, you know, the, the master doesn't normally go out of his way to thank <laughs> the servant for doing what he's just supposed to do and so she talks a little bit about that in our relationship with uh, God and with Jesus Christ and I liked how at the end she talks about how about by entering into the covenant of baptism we demonstrate to the Father to the Son and to ourselves that we need a Redeemer we desire to make their work our work in short we choose to become servants or slaves to the Lord to go where he calls us to go to say what he directs us to say and to become what he alone enables us to become. Following Christ's example is how we grow in faith, obedience, and knowledge of the Father and the Son. To know them is the supreme mode of being, whether in this life or in the next. It is founded on personal motivation to follow their commands because we love them and know that we were and are perfectly loved by them.